Welcome to Whores Talk Horror. We're not really whores. We just like wordplay. Hello and welcome to Horse Talk Horror. I'm Sharon. And I'm Melinda. We are nearing the end of 2020, aka the worst year ever. Thank God. Um, right? So it is time to do our annual year-end horror movie review. Uh, this will be a spoiler-free discussion of all the horror movies that Mindy and I have watched this year uh, that came out in 2020. This will be part one. We watched a lot of movies this year, so next week we will have the second half of our discussion. Overall, 2020 had some pretty good movies, but there were definitely some stinkers. Um, But we're going to discuss them all, the good, the bad, and the meh. (laughs) So without further ado, uh, let's begin. Sharon, what's our first movie? All right, so the first movie we have to talk about is The Mortuary Collection. Uh, I love a good anthology movie. Um, I know you do too, Mindy. This stars Clancy Brown from The Shawshank Redemption. Uh, Caitlin Custer is also in this. She's from the Teen Wolf TV series. So this is an anthology movie about a creepy old mortician who manages a very strange mortuary all alone until a young woman shows interest in working for him. The mortician tells the young apprentice a series of stories about those who have died in the town. Mm. A little bit of trivia. The scenes in and around the mortuary were filmed in Astoria, Oregon, where they filmed the Goonies. Um, so it, and it had that look to it. Um, and I'm a huge, huge Goonies fan. So uh, that kind of made me a little nostalgic. But it was very, very beautiful. It was a beautifully, gorgeously shot film. Besides just how beautiful the outdoor shots are, all the sets, uh, the color tones, of the movie, they all reminded me a lot of Tim Burton or Guillermo del Toro's films. I was not really expecting much because it was, I think it came directly out to Shudder. So I was kind of thinking this might be like a low budget anthology movie, but it was not at all. The production value of this film is just amazing. I was not expecting that at all. As far as all the little short films, uh, some are better than others. Uh, There is one (laughs) short film um, or short story, I should say, where uh, it kind of deals with the patriarchy. And it was just freaking hilarious. I loved it. Um, The message behind that one was really good. It basically flipped the whole script of the whole like frat boys taking advantage of unsuspecting college girls. But it's not overly gory. There's definitely a few scenes that were pretty nasty. Uh, There was a nod to the Halloween, original Halloween movie that I appreciated. And the stories, I thought, got better and better as they went on. And the movie actually ended up being a lot darker than I thought it was going to be. Um, Besides Trick or Treat, this is probably up there as like being one of my favorite anthology movies. Cool. So definitely recommend it if you have not seen it. I had seen it pop up on Shudder and it looked good. It just I just didn't get around to it. But sweet. Good. I'll, I will watch that. Put it on your list. Put it on your list. Awesome. All right, Mindy. Well, speaking of Shudder, actually, our next movie is Spiral starring uh, Jeffrey uh, Boyer Chapman. Um, from American Horror Story 1984, uh, Ari Cohen from It Chapter 2, and Jennifer Laporte, who's in iZombie, which I've also heard is really good and I've never w- had a chance to watch it. Written by Colin uh, Minihan and John Poliquin, uh, who wrote the Grave Encounter movies. I like the first one. I don't know if I've seen the second, but Anyway, it's a little side note. Um, And it's about a same-sex couple who move to a small town to enjoy a better quality of life and raise their daughter with strong social values. But when neighbors throw a very strange party, nothing is as it seems in their picturesque neighborhood. Sharon, thoughts? Yeah, so my main complaint with this movie is that one of the main characters just makes some really, really bad decisions. (laughs) Uh, But I guess if they didn't do that there wouldn't really be a movie the movie takes place in 1995 and i think the scariest part about this whole film is that basically 
25 years later, after the film takes place, in real life now, we still see just how hateful society is and just, you know, how narrow-minded many people's views are. Things haven't really changed that much. Homophobia, racial profiling, xenophobia is still just extremely prevalent. Um, and yeah, this... This last year has shown that more and more. Um, I did love that the two main characters were both gay men and they were not portrayed in stereotypical roles. Yeah. Uh, you don't really see the LGBTQ community represented in horror movies too much. Uh, there is definitely some good tension in the film. And I did like the very, very end of the film. But there was just way too many major plot holes that I thought were extremely frustrating. And I mean, with horror movies, you have to kind of expect plot holes yeah I just couldn't get past some of them yeah I mean to a degree you can accept plot holes I feel like um I loved uh Jeffrey Boyer Chapman as uh Malik aka the only character who seems to notice the very obviously weird things happening in the neighborhood except that he does not tell his partner about how their house was broken into several times I mean just saying. He did notice the weird things going on, but he didn't tell the one person he should have told. So that that's kind of like my biggest complaint about the movie. But anyways, yeah, continue. Yeah, there was like the whole house alarm incident, like, and they fa- they saw that the go- the old guy was like hanging out by their house. Like, I, whatever. Yeah. I mean, like you said, it, it had flaws. Um, I had a really hard time watching him relive the... Uh, the hate crime flashbacks um clearly the character i guess that's a tiny spoiler sorry but not really because it's like literally the first opening scene of the movie but uh, i just thought it started out really promising and then sadly just didn't maintain that promise and i agree i like seeing uh the lgbtq community represented in horror movies in a in a more like normal non-stereotypical way but i just i i i think that that makes it even all the more disappointing because I want this movie to like be better I guess is what I'm trying to say um I did also like the very very end though so lots of mixed feelings but overall uh I didn't really think it held up all that much I agree yeah I also was just had higher expectations for it and really wanted it to succeed um but it's fine (laughs) (laughs) these things happen I would recommend it. You know, I still, I, I didn't hate it. Yeah. And I actually, my friend who uh, recommended this to me watched it like, I think twice. And he was like really all excited about it. So hmm. I was kind of surprised because he's a hard, uh, what do I try to say? Like, I was gonna say he drives a high, hard bargain, but that's not what I'm trying to say. So <laughs> maybe I'll just stop talking. But yeah, well, let's move on to the next movie. <laughs> Mindy, do you like pornos? Yeah. Doesn't everyone? (laughs) Have you seen the horror movie titled Porno? No, I haven't yet. I just saw it pop up, though, on uh, Shudder. But I want you to tell me about it because I kind of want to see it. All right. So (laughs) it's an an interesting movie. Uh, It stars Larry (laughs) Saperstein, who is in the High School Musical series. Um, or uh, sorry, I should say he's in the high school musical, the TV series, not the movies. Uh, Robbie Tan, who's in Preacher, and Jillian Moeller. She's also done some TV, nothing I've seen. Um, I mean, as far as like the cast, there's a lot of um, unknown uh, actors and actresses in it. Uh, it's about Five teen employees at a local movie theater in a small Christian town who discover a mysterious old film hidden in its basement. They unleash an alluring succubus who gives them a sex education written in blood. Um, By the way, I'm going to give credit to IMDb for basically all the uh, most of the trivia and all the plot descriptions so we probably should have said that in the beginning we did not write most of it Uh, you 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 can't take credit for uh who gives them a sex education written in blood i wish i could take credit for that um i mean we definitely uh doctored some of these up a bit and changed them around but anyways you got to give credit where credit is due 
So my thoughts on this film, um, for one, this movie really made me miss movie theaters and also really crave popcorn. Uh, it took place in the 1990s and there is a lot of really cool references to different 90s movies. Um, the theater itself was like just kind of cool and it made me nostalgic for the days, you know, when we used to go to the movies like normal people. Um, and there was also a reference to Madonna's sex book that hey. I really appreciated because that was like the most scandalous thing when we were growing up. In the before times. Yes. When we could go places <laughs> freely. Yes. It made me really, really miss the before times. Um, <laughs> other other than that, I liked the concept of the movie, but the execution of it could have definitely been better. I think it could have really pushed the boundaries more. Um, I get that it's a low budget film and I will give this movie a lot of credit for one scene that was so graphic and realistic looking that it will make every man who watches it extremely uncomfortable and squirm in their seats. Uh, Spencer and I watched this together and Spencer couldn't even look at the screen. I have a question. True story. Yeah. Does it involve a penis and something getting cut off? Um, or is it even better? We'll, we'll just leave it at that. Well, the you got it part right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Honestly, I don't even remember if it got cut off or it got some 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 shit happened. Some shit happened, <laughs> and they and they lingered on it way longer than I would have liked them to linger on it. <laughs> but they also, I think, did that because they wanted to make the most out of the money and time and energy that they spent into making the practical effect. And nice. also, I think they did it for humor's sake to say, hey, look at this. We're going to force you to look at this. Look at this. You can't look away. You got to keep on looking at this. And I said, nope. And meanwhile, while, while Spencer was hiding his eyes, I was just like squealing with laughter because obviously like I don't have that part. It doesn't really bother me. I can imagine it's probably pretty painful, but I just thought it was just so wonderful as a woman to see a scene like this in a movie considering the amount of brutality that we've seen directed towards women in basically every horror movie ever made i think it's time for more uh penis torture scenes <laughs> i just think it's really funny that they actually took time to let the camera linger to be like we fucking paid like half our budget just for this so we're getting our money's worth <laughs> that's yeah. i think i have to see it now for sure Honestly, I think you might enjoy this movie. Um, definitely just because you and I spent so many, like we spent so many days in our childhood going to see movies, especially during the summers when we'd have summers off in high school. Like we'd go to the theater all the time. Uh, yeah. So it's it's not a horrible movie. It's not a great movie. It's just, it's fun and I would recommend it. Yeah, it's definitely like half comedy uh, with a low budget in basically one location. And I I, uh, I thought that what they did with what they had was good. Okay, cool. Moving right along. <laughs> yes, thank you. Moving right along. We have The Invisible Man, the remake from 2020. Writer, director, well, I guess director, screenwriter, uh, Lee Wanell, uh, one of the writers of Saw, but also one of the writers of Insidious 3, which he also directed. So that's promising. Um, stars Elizabeth Moss. I think we all know her at this point. Um, Oliver Jackson Cohen, who's Luke Crane from The Haunting of Hill House. And Aldous Hodge. That's, that's like the most like distinguished sounding name. <laughs> I love it. Uh, from Straight Outta Compton and Hidden Figures. Um, when Cecilia's abusive ex takes his own life and leaves her his fortune, she suspects his death. Death was a hoax. As a series of coincidences turn lethal, Cecilia works to prove that she is being hunted by someone nobody can see. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I I was not a huge fan of this movie. I'm going to say that like just right off the bat. So I'm being kind of silly with it. Okay, so a little fun trivia. In no way is this a remake of the 1933 Claude Rains film of the same name, though there are some subtle winks, um, such as, for instance, uh, Adrian, who is the uh, abusive ex-boyfriend slash uh, t the title film character, The Invisible Man. Um, Adrian's 
password to his door is 1933, which is the year the original film came out. Um, also, a few name references are in the movie itself. Uh, Griffin is Adrian's last, na- last name in the new movie. Dr. Jack Griffin is the Invisible Man in the original, played by Claude Rains. So, yay, fun. Uh, when I- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Juan Allen and his crew used a combination of old school techniques and state of the art CGI wizardry to bring the invisible man to life uh, with some scenes requiring a fully green suited actor that could be painted out later and others achieved with nothing more than a simple bit of string that is cool that they would still do that some props guy would be hidden in a cabinet and he would pull this piece of string and a door would close or a cabinet would open it made you realize that how you do a visual effect doesn't matter. It's only the end result that matters. So yeah, so that that was cool about it. Um, but I overall, I did actually think it, it had some good tension, but it was long, um, both building of and man- maintaining that tension throughout the movie. Eh, I don't know. Initially, it was hard for me to be totally objective because I did see the original movie as a kid, which was always more campy to me. But... The idea of a potential stalker or sorry, a totally fucking obsessed crazy stalker getting access to like tactics that this guy is using. That is totally frightening and scary. Like I'm stuttering even trying to say that. Sharon? Yeah, it was, you know, this movie was hyped up so much to be like such an amazing movie and it was better than I thought it would be, but it was definitely not as good as people hyped it up to be. Um obviously elizabeth moss is fantastic as always god damn her she is good isn't she i she is such a good actress i like her i just wish she wasn't a scientologist <laughs> sorry i i, I she that. is such a good actress <laughs> anyway go <I> ahead <laughs> you know scientology has some extra actor training in shut their... up spencer all right <laughs> spencer be quiet all right i mean it's a big budget studio film so You know, of course, it's going to be entertaining. Um, It does do a pretty good job of creating a lot of tension without relying solely on jump scares. And I also do really appreciate the use of practical effects because Mm -hmm. I hate when movies get so caught up in like, oh, we have access to use uh, CGI and, you know, let's use computers for everything. And it just takes all the magic out of it, I think. Um, And a lot of the art out of it you know yeah yeah so um yeah that is definitely uh, a bonus now that you mentioned that also who doesn't love seeing a female lead in a movie totally kick the shit out of her abuser so uh yeah, yeah. if you are in the mood for a big budget horror movie mm-hmm. i would recommend it Yeah, I think, yeah, if you know, yeah, it's definitely something that like has an audience and people, that audience is plentiful and yeah. And isn't there going to be a sequel? I don't know, but it didn't do bad at the box office, right? Like it was actually, it was No, it wasn't in the box office. It came straight to VOD. Yeah, sorry. I guess I should have missed or changed my wording, but I still think of it. Like when it was available to stream, I feel like it was doing well people said so i have no idea yeah it wasn't bad but i was also like "Eh." all right let's move moving on sharon what do we have next all right so we went from big budget studio hollywood horror film to a small independent horror film sweet uh the wolf of snow hollow uh which was recommended to me to watch by a friend it stars ricky lindholm uh, sorry, Ricky Lindholm from Garfunkel and Oates, Robert Forster, Woo. who was in Twin Peaks season three, um, and many, many, many other things. Um, great character actor. Mm-hmm. And Jim Cummings, who is actually better known for producing, directing, and writing. Um, and he's not acted in a lot of stuff, but Ooh. he actually wrote, directed, and starred in this movie. Damn. Yeah, very impressive. He's not a slacker. Um <laughs> So, speaking of Twin Peaks, this also takes place in a a small mountain town. So, terror grips a small mountain town as bodies are discovered after each full moon. Losing sleep, raising a teenage daughter, and caring for his ailing father, Officer Marshall struggles to remind himself there's no such thing 
as werewolves. Hmm. Uh, a little bit of trivia. This was Robert Forrester's final film Aww. before he sadly passed away. So thoughts on the film? Loved the small town vibes. It really, really reminded me of a mix between Twin Peaks and also uh, Clay Pigeons, which is one of my favorite comedy, uh, what would you say, like comedy murder crime film how would you describe we've talked about that movie a lot lately i I think because of the event because of freaky because we've been talking about vince vaughn but we've mentioned clay we talk about that movie a lot i've realized honestly i think we've only mentioned it like once or twice but we've never really discussed it other than it's a great movie um and it is is. (laughs) everyone should watch it uh the dialogue in this movie is kind of interesting it's very very stylized and it's also done sort of like a play it's like a lot of you know quick banter back and forth with no breaks between the actors talking uh similar to the way uh the dialogue is in the movie the house of yes which was a play so which was a play but also just it it reminded me a lot of the house of yes because that's another movie that I absolutely love. We should revisit um, that, actually. Put it on the list. I actually just watched that not too, too long ago. Um, love, I love Parker Posey. Anyways, back to this movie. Um, the editing in this film was a little bit disjointed for me. They would be like flashbacks, and then it would go to the present. And it wasn't always super clear to me anyways that... Uh something was taking place in the past or in the present. And I kept asking Spencer, I'm like, wait, is this a flashback or is this like currently what's going on? (laughs) And I think he was a little confused about that as well. Yeah, but I think that was part of the point. Yeah, well, knowing now, I would like to give this movie a rewatch just because I know what happens um, just to see, because obviously it'll make more sense on rewatch. Also, it's a good enough movie to where I would rewatch it anyway. but I kind of think that if you're going to do that with a movie, it should be a little more clear. I don't know. It just it felt like they were doing it more for like to be overly stylized or to mm. just try and do something different. But it it wasn't really working for me. Um, the main character also was kind of annoying and a bit of a dick. Uh, but you actually still like him. And I I mean, that's totally the point of how his character is supposed to be. Uh, the ending of this movie was fucking great um it was definitely a different kind of werewolf movie um i think my favorite werewolf movie of all time is still probably silver bullet but uh this this is also uh up there on the list so yeah i totally totally recommend checking this movie out okay um well from one small town to i guess a rental house (laughs) I am not good at transition. Good transition. <laughs> Our next movie is The Rental, uh, starring Alison Brie, who we all know from Community, Mad Men, and Glow, uh, Jeremy Allen White, uh, who is Lip on Shameless, and motherfucking Sheila Vond, who is like one of my favorite actresses right now. Uh, she is the titular girl from A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, and she is just one of those uh, under appreciated a fantastic actresses uh the plot two couples on an oceanside getaway grow suspicious that the host of their seemingly perfect rental home may be spying on them before long what should have been a celebratory weekend trip turns into something far more sinister as well-kept secrets are exposed and the four old friends come to see each other in a whole new light uh this was or this is i guess the feature film directorial debut of dave franco um who i actually have always really liked um but he's i think the less offensive of the francos probably (laughs) anyway thoughts sharon um so this movie came out right before spencer and i were going to stay in an airbnb on a farm in michigan and i was like i am not watching this movie before we go um (laughs) because good call yeah I knew it would fuck with my mind once we were at the Airbnb if I watched this first. Um, So immediately you get this totally uneasy feeling and things just kind of keep building 
from there, um, just from like the very start of the movie. And it's not just the uneasiness between the outside element that you feel is, you know, going to threaten these people staying in the house. It's also from the main characters. Uh, As the viewer, you're really, really uncomfortable with the interactions of the main characters on screen because you know that there's things about them that other characters in the film are not aware of. Does that make sense? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, it does to me Uh, because I saw it, but (laughs) no, I know what you mean. Yeah. So there's that. So you're, you're uncomfortable for, for multiple reasons. And I think the film does a really good job of slowly building tension throughout the entire film and not just relying on jump scares or making things really obvious as to what's going on. There's definitely some twists that I did not see coming. Um, I thought it was going to be just a predictable home invasion movie. But I was pleasantly surprised that it veered off in a direction that I was not expecting. And it just made it so much better for me. And also, this is going to be the only spoiler. (laughs) Um, But the dog lives. Thank God. (laughs) Because I was like, oh, are you fucking kidding me? Like, I anyone who is a regular listener of the show knows how we feel about animal deaths in movies especially horror movies and i was kind of bummed right away that i was thinking oh this poor dog you know but he ended up living which was fucking awesome so uh yeah you can watch the movie now if you haven't seen it knowing that the dog is going to be okay which will probably make you enjoy the rest of the movie even more i totally agreed yeah, it does for me. Like, I will Google that shit just because I'm out if there's, like, horrible animal deaths. But I I actually thought it felt kind of predictable, um, at least in terms of the, like, big secret reveals between the characters. But it kept me engaged, even when I thought the story felt a little forced. Um, largely, I think, because the performances were all fantastic, which was not a surprise to me. Um, I didn't mention him at the beginning, but Dan Stevens... Uh, who is a gem, is also one of the stars in this film. And he won me over not too long ago with his performance on the show Legion. He's amazing. Also, Alice and Brie High or on Ecstasy is always a good time. So I didn't hate it for sure. It wasn't what I was expecting, but I thought it was a solid directorial debut, honestly. Um, And as with all haunted or slasher stock houses, the home was lovely. It was a very nice home. I would stay in that <laughs> Airbnb. Um, yeah, I do agree that the it was super obvious from like the very opening scene that there was something going on with the main characters that I'm not going to say what it is. But yeah, that was it's predictable. Pretty, yeah. But I think <laughs> that kind of um, I think they did that to make you think that the rest of the movie was going to be predictable. Mm-hmm. And then they threw these fucking curveballs at you. Gotcha. At least that was kind of my assumption. But speaking of um, (laughs) lies and secrets, lies and secrets. Yeah. Speaking of secrets, (laughs) I'm going to be talking about The Lie, written and directed by Vina Sud, who is the writer and producer of The Killing, which is one of my all time favorite true crime mystery uh, dramas. I don't think I knew that she was the director. Uh, yeah, and Peter Sarsgaard is in it. Uh, yeah. Muriel Enos. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced her name, but she plays Detective Linden from The Killing. She's badass. She's very badass, although I did not like her character in this movie. I mean, she's, <laughs> it was very well acted, but I kept screaming at the TV. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck are you doing? Um and Joey King, who plays Gypsy Rose in the oh. TV miniseries The Act. Um, she's fantastic. She is a really, really talented young actress um, who's going to go on to have an amazing career, I'm guessing. So it's about a father and daughter. Uh, the father is driving his daughter to a dance camp to drop her off for the weekend. On their way there, they spot the girl's best friend who is at a bus stop on the side of the road. They stop to offer her a ride, and soon their good intentions result in terrible consequences. And then they drive by a cemetery, and they turn around, and she's no longer in the backseat of the car, and her name's Mary. (laughs) 
<laughs> Resurrection, Mary Jo. Ha, ha, sorry. Apology accepted. All right. <laughs> so this movie asks the question, how far would you go to protect your child? I mean, that's basically the main yeah. message of this movie, which I don't have kids, so I don't know. Um, the right. whole time I was like, throw her fucking ass in juvie. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I liked this movie, but I didn't love it. The ending made it better, but overall the plot had like, once again, it's another one of those movies where it was like just too many plot holes in it for me to just kind of overlook it. Um, for one, the parents in this movie both kind of suck and they're really <laughs> dumb. And especially considering that one of them, the mother is a lawyer. She should know better. Uh, I know like you, if you find yourself in a situation like this, no one knows how they're going to act, but someone who is a lawyer should be a little bit smarter, I think. Um, and I won't really say why it's important that she's a lawyer and should be smarter, but it is. Okay. Uh, Joey King, she's great in this. Um, yeah, she plays some really intense characters in her films. Between this and Gypsy Rose, like, holy shit. Um, but yeah, to me, this movie seemed more like a Lifetime movie than like a movie that would have had a theatrical release. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I honestly, I'd be kind of curious, Mindy, to hear your thoughts on it. Okay. I, I guess I expected a little more considering that uh, it was written by the same person who did the killing because I think that show is just phenomenal. But I never saw the act. So or, or the whatever the Gypsy Rose movie I never saw. I, I just can't. I don't think I can. So but I know that girl's supposed to be good. You watch the the real documentary on it, which. Oh, is- yeah. It, pretty much the same thing. It's fucked um, up enough. <laughs> it very fucked up. All right, Mindy. Uh, we got another uh, dud coming up, or do you have a better movie for us? Well, that depends on your definition of dud, I guess. <laughs> or your definition of a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, what we have is The Grudge. Um, which seems to be listed literally as like the grudge 2020 whenever I would look it up online, but it's yet another remake or whatever of the infamous Japanese original series. Um, it stars an amazing group of people. However, um, Andrea Riseborough, who's in possessor Mandy Birdman, kind of everything. Like she's a great character actress, uh, Young Sulu, a.k.a. John Cho, who, of course, we know from Harold and Kumar and Star Trek. Uh, Damien Bashir from The Hateful Eight, The Nun, Machete Kills. Lynn Mofo Shay, Lynn Shay uh, from the Insidious Every horror movie, movie ever. <laughs> yeah, the Insidious movies. She's fucking badass. And Betty Askick and Gilpin. Just to name a few ooh, ooh. of the cast. Um, this is directed by Nicholas Pesch, who also did, I think I'm saying that right. I apologize Pesch. if I'm not. Um, he also directed The Eyes of My Mother from 2016, which was a fantastic, somewhat gothic, creepy ass gem that kind of slid under the radar. Uh, basic plot, you know it. House is cursed by a vengeful ghost that dooms those who enter it with a violent death. We all know it. Let's all say the plot together. <laughs> Well, funny you should mention that because that actually fucking happens at one point in the movie, like in the middle of the movie. But I'll get to that. A little bit of trivia. This is not a reboot. Uh, The director confirmed that. It takes place during The Grudge and The Grudge 2. And I'm speaking of the American remakes. Um, So there's that. Uh, The director took inspiration from The Exorcist and The Changeling, actually, for this film, Sharon. One of your favorites. Two of my favorites. There's some some little winks uh, to the original Zhuan uh, Japanese film, um, 44 Rayburn Drive, which is the address of the cursed house, is a wink to actually the short film, uh, which is like a bunch of fours. I'm not going to count how many of them that was done in 1998 by uh, Takiji, Takashi Shimizu, excuse me, who did the original Juan movie. So yay, a few winks. Uh, here's the <laughs> thing. I thought The Eyes of My Mother was an interesting movie. Um, and if The Grudge is good for anything, it does show off the director's eye because dude can light a scene. The Eyes of My Mother was in black and white, 
But both that and The Grudge visually have a kind of like otherworldly feel to them, I feel like. Um, And both films were gorgeous to watch. I just wish it wasn't the fucking grudge again. I, I see what he was going for, and I appreciate the thought that he put into this, but uh, the connections to the original Juwan house were fun, whatever. Uh, but I, I made the mistake of forgetting that Americans need shit literally spelled out for them instead of left obscure or left up to the imagination. There's this entire scene where... Uh, Commissioner Burrell from The Wire, a.k.a. the actor Frankie Faison, who's been in tons of stuff, and he plays Lynn Shay's husband in this. He literally spelled out the entire fucking plot of all of these grudge movies to Jackie Weaving in like five to seven minutes over coffee. Like, why the fuck did we need that? Who's Jackie Weaving? Oh, she's in this too. The actress, Jackie Weaving. She's just, there's, it's an amazing cast. Like, I'd even mention half the people that are in it. It's so amazing. But she's a British gotcha. actress, and she's been in Googler. And Google Frankie phase on too. He's in tons of shit. But what's the fucking point? I guess is my we wasted a really good cast. Like, here's a thought: Hollywood could spend money on maybe an original film by Nicholas Pesh instead of maybe remaking this, or just throw more money at Mike Flanagan for God's sakes. But like, don't stifle potential talent with worn out tropes. We're done trying to reinvent this wheel. Let's try something new. But if we could keep the creepy kid named Melinda, that would be awesome because I'm not going to lie. It was kind of hot hearing John Cho call my name over and over in that one scene. He's so cute. I just think he's so cute. But that's the only positive I really have to say. Rant over. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Sorry. Yeah, I'm going to agree with a lot of things that you said. Um, I have not seen the, was it? The eyes of my eyes mother. Of my mother. Um, but I did see Nicholas Pesh's movie Piercing, which I was not really a huge fan of. And we discussed that. I think we actually discussed that in our 2019 end of year horror movie roundup. Um, the one thing I did like about that film, though, was you're right. He does have a great eye. And that movie was also very beautifully shot. Um, and it reminded me a lot of David Lynch, actually. But that movie was definitely more style over substance. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I just don't understand Hollywood's obsession for remaking movies, even though you said it's technically not a reboot or they're not calling it a reboot. Whatever. It's still it not an original concept. <laughs> um, yeah, there was no tension whatsoever. The movie only relied on jump scares, which honestly didn't even fucking work because I thought they were all pretty predictable. Uh, I didn't care about any of the characters, um, except for Betty Gilpin. I did like her scenes, I have to say. Other than that, I think this was like a total waste of time. Yeah, because it kind of feels like you're banging your head against a wall, literally, because like, why bother getting invested with any of the characters? Because they're all going to step foot in the house. (laughs) And it'll be awful and horrible. And I feel the same way about actually Betty Gilpin and John Cho. I love them both. And I was kind of very sad. (laughs) But... Go, I knew that's what this movie was about, and that's what happened. So, yeah, let's please stop with the remakes. Well, let's move on to something else. Sharon, I did not see this one, but I know that you have told me about it before. Can you tell us about the platform, if you will? Yeah, so let's talk about an original film. Uh, the platform, <laughs> Here's which... Here's an idea. <laughs> right? Um, we did discuss this on one of our episodes, I think, in the beginning of this year, so I'm not going to get into it too much, um, but because it qualifies as our one of the movies we watched this year that was released in 2020. We have to put it on the list. Uh, the star is Ivan uh, Masagu. I'm probably horribly mispronouncing that. It's probably Masagay. Masage? Ivan Masage. Uh, he's from Pan's Labyrinth, and I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Uh, Antonia San Juan is also in this film. It is a Spanish film that is set in a vertical prison where inmates live two to a cell, and they only get to eat when a platform passes through their level and pauses for two minutes while they feast. The horror of it all is that the table starts full at the top, and those near the bottom only get to eat what is left by the end. A um, little bit of trivia, since there are 333 cell levels and there are two prisoners in every cell, the total number of prisoners is Mindy. 666, six, six, I love it. That's, aw- <laughs> that's an awesome detail. 
Yeah, I didn't know that until just like last week when I was writing this up. Um, So basically the prison is basically hell itself. Very cool. I mean, not cool, but you know what I mean. But this (laughs) is a great original movie. I mean, if you're tired of like all the old horror tropes and just all you know the movies that are coming out every week that are just like the same old thing over and over and over again highly recommend this um people get randomly rotated to another level of the prison after one month so everyone gets to experience what it's like to live life at the top and middle and the bottom of interesting the food chain but also it's a metaphor for real life you know yeah. you have the upper class middle class lower class and um, of course people quickly forget where they come from uh shows the worst aspects of human nature and every man you know it's just every man for themselves uh very similar <laughs> to uh how things really are and especially this year i mean once again it just like this movie just like calls out like how horrible mankind can be. Um, the movie makes statements about human selfishness, consumerism, immigration, prison systems, uh, you know, civilized people becoming less civilized and dehumanized. It's it's a metaphor for all that. And I, I love it. It's, you know, it's I highly recommend it. It's could be a little hard to watch. Um, I think I watched this at the beginning of the year, like right after you know, we started being quarantined and everything. And um, it was a little depressing. (laughs) But now that we're all kind of like used to this new way of life, um, it's definitely something that I think you could watch now and just really appreciate. Okay, yeah, I remember you talking about this. And that was exactly why I didn't watch it. Because I was like, yeah, I can't deal with that right now. But (laughs) I do really like the idea of it. And it sounds like a really interesting movie. So cool. Another one that, I don't know, not related. I have no transition. We're going to go from hell to a one-bedroom apartment. Literally, the movie's called One Bedroom or like 1BR, like the abbreviation. I don't know. Going from hell to a one-bedroom apartment in L.A. with like horrible, weird neighbors, that kind of sounds like hell to me <laughs> yeah this is true and that yeah that's true so maybe stay on that on that same note then following that trend um yeah one bedroom starring uh nicole bryden bloom and taylor nichols from pen 15 which i know i still have to watch um, you need to watch that yesterday i know oh my god I know. season two is so fucking good everyone watch pen 15 it's amazing i know thank you i've heard i will i will do it um New to Los Angeles, Sarah tries to start anew, but her neighbors are not exactly what they seem. Soon she will find out that there are severe consequences for breaking the rules in her apartment complex building. And I don't really know why that made me laugh, but it kind of did. Some trivia, the first word of the name of the apartment complex is asilo. I I hope I'm saying that right. I'm trying my best, which means asylum in Spanish. So there you go. Uh, Sharon, thoughts? I really liked it. Um, I know it didn't get like great reviews, but I thought it was a really good psychological horror movie. And it reminded me a lot of The Invitation, Mm. which is also, um, I think, a really good, uh, unique sort of uh, psychological horror movie recommend the invitation as well um, yeah which i liked better than this but yeah the entire movie just made me feel very very uneasy and i I totally recommend this movie agreed yeah i found it a tad predictable but having a hunch as to what was coming only kind of added to my uneasiness Um, without saying too much everyone has anxiety when moving or looking for a new place and This movie certainly won't help ease any of those fears, that's for sure. Um, I don't know that I'd say it's a must watch if you're in the process of moving, but maybe you should watch it. I don't know. You should probably watch this before you decide to move to a new residence. Okay, so you are saying, because I'm saying I don't know that I, but okay, I'm saying I wasn't sure if I would recommend it because it might freak people out. But to be fair, that's a good point. Maybe have an idea of what you could expect. Maybe you have an idea of what you should avoid. If everyone at the <laughs> new, go. if everyone at the new apartment complex is just too nice, there's a reason for that. Good point. Maybe, uh, 
yeah, be a little wary of that. Um, I will say another like little spoiler here. Um, the cat in this movie oh, <laughs> shit. does not do too well. Um, it wasn't. So, as, I, th- I feel like it wasn't as bad as I thought because I had texted you, I think, or something. It was like, oh, but honestly, after that scene, maybe about 10 yeah. minutes afterwards, I completely forgot there was even a cat in it because I was so horrified at everything else that was going on. Right. I was like, oh, shit, there was a cat, too. OK, over, I'm over the cat scene. Um, but man, it gets pretty brutal for the people, too. I was just going to say right really quick about the cat. I actually kind of have a problem with people who like knowingly take a residence that says no animals because like Spencer and I. <laughs> well, but that's different because you move there and then these animals came into your lives like it was a little different. I feel like she knowingly already had a cat and like moved in and was like, I'll just hide it, which cats love fucking windows. How are you going to like, cause we did that when I was in college, my roommate did that with my first cat. Um, and we fucking got caught. And that's why that cat, I, maybe that's why I'm kind of bitter. Cause poor dreads like lived around in a few different homes before she finally made it to me. Um, but just don't do that. I think that's the moral of this movie. Fuck the humans. Just don't take a lease if you have an animal and it says no animals <laughs> yeah Th- this girl fucked up for sure but um, yeah i do recommend it i think it was good and inten- it was intense like you know yeah all that good stuff all right so getting away from the kind of um living nightmare movies mm-hmm. a little um this movie is a little more fun it's extraordinary starring will forte uh comedian claudia odorty who i think is hilarious uh, Maeve Higgins and Barry Ward are also in this film. So it is about Rose, who is a sweet but lonely driving instructor in rural Ireland. But she is also gifted with supernatural abilities. She has a love-hate relationship with her talents and tries to ignore the constant spirit-related request from locals to exercise, possess rubbish bins, or haunted gravel. <laughs> um, but... Christian Winter, a washed up one hit wonder rock star played by Forte, has made a pact with the devil for a return to greatness. He puts a spell on a local teenager and intends on sacrificing her to Satan. Her terrified father asks Rose to help him save his daughter. Um, Okay, not having seen this at all. But like casually having seen the title around, that was so not what I was expecting the plot to be about. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's definitely unique. It's uh, a unique movie. And I liked it a lot more than I was expecting to like it, especially because Will Forte, ever mm. since watching him on The Last Man on Earth, I've just had a really hard time watching him because his character on that show is the worst. And I just fucking hate him i'm like so annoyed by him but i actually kind of enjoyed him in this movie um so yeah that didn't even bother me uh a little bit of trivia when rose first arrives at the martin household there is a shot of her standing in front of the house with light shining down on her Mm. from the window which is a recreation of the poster image from the movie the exorcist um there's also several additional nods to the exorcist um throughout the film including a very overt one when Martin mentions it by name. Um, so yeah, if you're fans of extra, the exorcist, there's those little Easter eggs. Yeah. But besides, besides the fact that Will Forte is in it and I'm not (laughs) the biggest fan of him, um, it was actually a pretty funny movie and there wasn't really much gore, but there is a lot of really gross scenes. (laughs) Um, not like bloody gross, but just like gross, gross. Uh, the main character Rose was great. She's like this super awkward, nerdy driving instructor who also happens to have strong psychic powers. And if you're looking for a fun supernatural comedy, I totally recommend this. Awesome. I don't know why sometimes I prefer my horror to be just horror, but I do own Shaun of the Dead, so I'll I'll remember this one. Um, I would say it's it's sim like a similar. Um, sense of humor i mean i kind of think um the uk does a really good job at combining horror 
with comedy. Yeah. Um, there's yeah. Truth Seekers, which I know you finished watching that TV show as well, oh, which was so good. Really good. Um, and it was funny and it had heart. But there's also like some genuinely scary moments. Totally. Um, and then, I mean, obviously, this is not they're not from the UK, but very similar styles in New Zealand. You know, you have like what we do in the shadows and Wellington paranormal. That's like true. I really enjoy horror comedy when it's done well. And I think, uh, New Zealanders and, uh, the UK, they do that very well. Yeah. Well, maybe Australia too. Cause wasn't little monsters Australia. Yes. That was an Australian, but I get your as well. point though. Yeah. 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 They're the UK sort of sense of humor, which expand expands to all those countries, uh, is definitely uh, something that I think we all appreciate. Very dry humor. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, maybe I'll, I'll check that out. Um, but speaking of, of like references to the exorcist, we talked about this movie quite a bit actually when we interviewed one of the actors, but, um, Next is The Ascent, uh, which stars uh, Robert uh, Kaczynski, uh, Peter Jason from They Live and Escape from L.A., and friend and previous guest of the podcast, Mr. Douglas Spain, who is lovely. Uh, After a series of disturbing supernatural events in his home, Joel, a young single father, comes to suspect that his young son may be possessed. Uh, Like I said, we did talk about this a lot. Before, so Sharon, any quick thoughts? Yeah, I mean, once again, um, as we said before, it's a bit of a different take on an exorcism movie. Uh, The set design was done extremely well. Uh, We talked a lot about that when we were talking to Douglas. Um, There was just a lot of attention to detail. If you want to hear the entire in-depth conversation about this movie and also like a look into some of the behind the scenes stuff of this film, you can check out that interview with Douglas Spain in episode 38. Uh, and he played one of the priests in this film who is called to perform the exorcism. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed this movie. Yeah, I did too. And I remember when we talked with him, we all kept saying it doesn't feel like a typical exorcism movie, whatever that means. But um I was I was in from like the very beginning like and as you said the set design and set dressing is just extraordinary. It's gorgeous to look at if nothing else, but I also thought it was a good movie. So awesome. Sharon, what do we got next? We have another movie that's gorgeous to look at but falls a little bit short. Okay. Um, Gretel and Hansel. Uh also an incredible cast in this movie, uh, Sophia Lillis from the It movies and also Sharp Objects, which um, that TV show I watched, I was it last year or this year for the very first time? And that is like such a fucking great show. Highly recommend it. Did you read that book? I did not read the book. I don't, I don't know if I want to read the book. <laughs> I actually think my mom stole my copy because I have Dark Matters as well, which is her other one. And that's... Uh, uh Gillian Flynn the writer of Gone Girl in case you're wondering who she is that's what we're talking about um she wrote the book and I liked Dark Matter better but the book my mom was like no Sharp Objects is like my jam like she really loved this one and then she watched the series too and was like I love it but it's fucked up it's so good so fucked up like every once in a while that show just pops in my head and I think about it and I just get the fucking creeps um Anyways, Anyways. sorry. Like a version. (laughs) Yeah, if you want to watch something better with Sophia Lillis in it, watch Sharp Objects. Ooh, burn. (laughs) Um, Samuel Leakey is in it. He plays uh, Hansel, and he's a very good young actor. And Alice Krieg, is it? She was in Deadwood, which I know you're a fan of, and The OA, which you're also a fan of. Is that how you pronounce her name? I believe so, because she, you know who she also was? She was Alma in the movie version of A Ghost Story way back in the 80s with Frank Sinatra. The woman oh, God, I hate that fucking movie. That, like, remember how we hate it? Because we both, if you've not read that book, A Ghost Story by, uh, who's it? It's just Ghost Story. Or Ghost Story. Is it Peter, it's Straub, right? Peter Straub? Peter Straub, one of the scariest books I've ever fucking read in my like, life. I tried to reread it, like, literally two years ago and, like, made it halfway and, like, had to stop. It's that good. But they made a movie in the early 80s with, like, 
Frank Sinatra, I think, and like old, they were all elderly, well-known actors, you know, in their aging years, because that's like the main characters. And she is the fucking ghost. I think it was Fred, Ast- uh, Fred Astaire, not Frank Sinatra. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, whatever. Fred Astaire, Frank Sinatra. But she's the like ghost in that movie. Okay. But she was and- much younger, so you probably don't. Yeah. No. Anyway. And she's she plays the witch in this, so she's heavily made up and made to look like thirty years older than she actually is. So I I would not have recognized her at all. all right. Um so I think we're all familiar with the story of Hansel and Gretel. Uh obviously they changed the title slightly to Gretel and Hansel, uh, <laughs> because this is more from the female perspective. Um So a long time ago in a distant fairy tale countryside, a young girl leads her little brother into a dark wood in desperate search of food and work only to stumble upon a nexus of terrifying evil. A little bit of trivia. At one point, the witch in this movie says, quote, what a world, end quote. Fans of the film Wizard of Oz will recognize this as the Wicked Witch of the West's final words as she melts. What a world! What a world! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Spencer. <laughs> um, the director of Gretel and Hansel is Osgood Perkins, who often shortens his name to just Oz. So uh, I'm guessing clever. he's a big Wizard of Oz fan. Um so it's definitely a bit different than the fairy tale that we all grew up with. Um, I will start off by saying that the film is absolutely beautiful to watch. There's even a scene with Gretel and Hansel tripping on magic mushrooms that was quite lovely. <laughs> um, the witch's house is very dark and cozy and inviting, but also super creepy. And I would totally live there. Um <laughs> Great cast. I mean, it was very well cast. The actors were all really good. However, that's basically where the compliments end, Um, unfortunately. Um, It was kind of long and slow, and I almost fell asleep, and it was just, it was lacking something. I did appreciate the whole, like, feminist girl power storyline to the film. I thought that was great. I just thought the movie needed more. Um, so yeah, it, not really, um, I wouldn't really recommend it. Okay. I feel like that's a reoccurring trend, like for 2020 movies, at least in my experience, which I think we'll probably hear more about that, like as we go further into our list, but there've been a lot of movies that I've watched, I feel like that I've watched that were like, like you were talking about the feminism, like sort of twist to it or, or part to it. And I'm like, but couldn't they have made it a better movie? And I, I have there's a few <laughs> movies on the list this year where I'm like, you have such a great message. Why can't you be better? Um, interesting. Okay. Um, the next movie I actually forgot I watched. Um, that good, hor- huh? Yeah, right. It wasn't horrible. Uh, it's behind you. Uh, it didn't work. <laughs> oh, we're on we're on Facetime, and I'm being an asshole to Sharon. That's the name of the movie. But, and yeah, bad joke. Uh, it's written and directed by Andrew Meckham and Matthew Whedon, who, as far as I can tell from the internet, is no relation to Joss Whedon, uh, starring Andy, Addie Miller, Elizabeth Berkner, Philip Brody, and, oh my God, you guys, Jan Broberg as the creepy Aunt <laughs> Beth. Now, if that name, Jan Broberg, does not ring a bell... It didn't for me at all until I looked this up on IMDb. She is the subject of the Netflix documentary Abducted in Plain Sight. What? The young girl. She's an actress? Yeah. It's her. She's an actress. She's actually wow. been acting in TV and film for quite a few years and done a few horror films, including fucking Maniac with Elijah Wood. Oh my God. Did she play one of his victims? I don't know. I didn't see it. Oh, I, I saw you, it. You said it wasn't that good. So... um. Yeah, I think I need to give that movie another watch as well. But holy shit, that's right? kind of crazy that she's like, after everything she went through, yeah. she decided to be a horror movie actress. But and okay, not cool. a bad one at that. Like, I, that, so like, I'm, first of all, nice to see she's doing well. Like, that's awesome. Um, that's kind of the most exciting <laughs> thing about this movie but um the plot it involves two sisters uh that find uh all the mirrors in their estranged aunt's house are covered or hidden when one of them happens upon a mirror in the basement the she unknowingly releases a malicious demon because of course 
<laughs> Under trivia, I literally wrote C starring. <laughs> um, it's predictable, not horrible, kind of fun, a few good scares, but that was literally kind of my takeaway. But how fucking amazing is that? Jan fucking Broberg from Abducted in Plain Sight is a horror movie actress. Who knew? This is uh, not one of the movies that I watched, but just based on your description of the plot, is it similar to Oculus at all? Uh, Sort of. Okay. Like, not <laughs> ultimately, but that idea of, like, the, like, estranged relative and then, but, but yeah, no, like, as far as the mirrors go, no, like, that's a different kind of entity, gotcha. if you will, haha. Ha. Wordplay. <laughs> what? I mean, I'm probably not going to watch this one. I was no, just No, but it was, if- I mean, if you, like, happen upon it and you're bored or whatever some afternoon or whatever, like... It's not going to make it's not bad. So <laughs> that's a terrible recommendation. But Jan Broberg, everybody, I'm really excited about hmm. that. Anyway, that part's interesting. Sharon, I don't know that I even knew about this next movie. So can you tell us about it? So I think this came. Um, I think this is a made for Netflix uh, movie. And I actually just recently found out about it. And I'm really, really glad I did because I thought it was awesome. Vampires versus the Bronx. Uh, it stars <laughs> Jaden Michael, Method Man, Zoe Saldana's in it, uh, Sarah Gaddon, who is in Castle Rock and True Detective. Wow. Uh, it's basically about a group of young friends from the Bronx that fight to save their neighborhood from gentrification and vampires. Love it. Uh, yeah, it's such a cool idea, I think, and very, very well done. Um, but I'll get to that in a minute. A couple little bits of fun trivia. The real estate company is called Murnau Enterprises after F.W. Murnau, who directed Nosferatu from 1922, which is considered to be the very first vampire film. Nice. Also, the symbol for Murnau Enterprises is the image of Vlad the Impaler, the real-life inspiration for Dracula. That's cool. Uh, um, so this movie reminded me of Stranger Things meets the Lost Boys. Holy the child- shit, really? Yeah. Oh my god. I gotta watch this. Um, you do need to watch this. Um, I I loved this movie. Um, the child actors were all really, really good. Um, they're very entertaining to watch as they pretty much had to carry the movie. So, like great casting on their part because they were just engaging and did such a good job. Um I think this is actually a movie that you could watch with your kids because wow. it's not overly gory. There's no nudity. There's not um, not really much swearing or anything like that. Um, yeah, if you have like kids that are maybe like, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, I think this is something that you could watch with them. It was funny. There was, you know, it had heart. Uh, I loved the family dynamics of the three kids with their parents and their grandparents. Um, Just like seeing like kind of like their backstories and where they grew up. They did a really good job with that. It's not a scary movie, but it definitely had some moments where, you know, there was a little bit of uh, tension and um, I don't know. It had its moments. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But mostly I think it was just like, fun and funny and the underlying message in the movie and using vampires as a metaphor for Mm. gentrification was just extremely clever and once again it's great that there's horror movies um and also as we talked about with spiral it's just great to see more and more horror movies that are becoming more diversified and you know you have movies that deal with the lgbtq community and black and brown communities and it's just we need more of that in hollywood yeah and luckily we have more of that on our list actually um but i was gonna say i feel like this to me have you ever seen attack the block okay it's funny that you mentioned that because when I was, I have not seen that, but also I was reading through some of the IMDb reviews and lots of people compared it to that movie. But a lot of people were being really cruel about it and just saying that like, this is a less better version of Attack the Block. Well, but Attack the Block, as far as I remember, also starring Nick Frost, oddly enough, who is, we were just talking about that whole Shaun of the Dead gang, but um attack the block in case and i might be missing it because i'm white and the kids in it are mostly uh black like city kids but there's no real underlying gentrification 
message in Attack the Block. It's more fun and more about like don't discount the kids because they kind of carry the movie and it features a young John Boyega. I think that's how you say his name. Apologies. But he's Finn from the new Star Wars movies. It's just a really fun, like that, it, it, I, I'm getting the similar vibes. Oh, and also starring the current Doctor from Doctor Who, side note, as Attack the Block. But this, I, I don't think that that comparison is a bad thing, because this sounds like it is equally as fun, but has good meaning for today's times, in these troubled times. I just think people were like, they totally ripped off that movie and did it not as well so well, whatever but, like have you seen the sandlot or the goonies or like there's so many movies about kid group of kids doing stuff for the greater good like fuck you <laughs> sorry yeah. i haven't even seen this now i'm offended <laughs> we'll watch it and let me know what you think i would love to know your opinion since you've actually seen attack the block you can do a good comparison i own it on itunes actually it's fun it's super fun i do recommend subtitles be just because their accents are so heavy but off off topic I, speaking of young I watch people everything sorry i watch everything with subtitles now anyways just because because we're old I just because we're old <laughs> but also i just find that um when you watch things with subtitles you pick up on a lot more subtleties than you would have if you didn't watch it with subtitles but yes i also do watch a lot of like british and um you know just other things that i'm like wait what what are they saying and there's like slang that I'm not necessarily like familiar with, you know. And yep. Depend. Yeah, and like whatever. right from the start in Attack the Block, because they're all like high school kids. So I'm like, even with subtitles, I don't really even know what you guys are saying because it's like teenage slang from like, you know, whatever. Britain. <laughs> so transitioning from young kids, whippersnappers to uh, old folks and vets, <laughs> let's talk about VFW. <laughs> Good segue. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is directed by uh, Joe Bigos, I think, or Bagos. Uh, apologies Bagos. if Joe I'm Bingo? mispronouncing that. Bagels, what? Um, who directed Bliss, the movie Bliss? <laughs> <laughs> Joe Bagels. <laughs> um, and this stars a shitload of people. Uh, Stephen Lang, William Sadler, Martin Cove, David Patrick Kelly. What up, Twin Peaks fans? Uh, Fred Williamson and this guy George Went. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Um, Norm! <laughs> <laughs> it, this movie, it's a grindhouse esque film about a group of war veterans who must de- defend their local VFW post and a teen who stole millions of dollars of a street drug named Hype from a deranged drug dealer and his army of drugged out zombies to seek revenge on them for the death of her sister and i know that sounds batshit insane and it is but this movie is fucking awesome this movie is batshit insane which is one of the reasons why i love it so much it's so good all the um the the old men the uh war veterans are totally badass uh, they did not forget their fighting skills from nam <laughs> um I also really liked the relationship between all of them. Like their banter just, it felt like really, really real. Um, It's extremely bloody and gory and violent. um, So much so that it's hard to even tell what's going on a lot of the (laughs) times during the fight scenes because it's just like so dark and gritty and there's just like so much blood and body parts flying everywhere. Um, It's so good. But it did kind of like subdue some of like the blood and guts uh, just because it was shot like very um, dark. Um, but yeah, I just thought it was like such a fun movie and it felt like it was something that would have been made in the seventies or eighties, which I love seventies and eighties horror. Um, so yeah, this one was just fucking outstanding. I think when we talked about this before, I mentioned that I actually did was surprised that it wasn't made in the seventies or eighties at first. Cause it, especially the way this movie opens, I was like, wait, I didn't realize this was old and it was not, but yeah, fucking love this movie. I didn't think that this would be something that would like interest me. I don't know why, but um, the war veterans are indeed super badass. And I thought this was a total blast Pun intended. <laughs> what? I'm actually looking forward to rewatching this because I haven't seen it since the beginning of this year. Yeah. And I, what you said about the relationships with all of the vets, like that is what sealed the deal for me. And all of those actors were just great. Yeah, it's a it's so great. 
just watch we have to and like the gore is so well done just watch it just shut up and watch it <laughs> maybe when you get off work share in with our next movie <laughs> when i get off my 12 hour shift yeah um, which is also the name of the next movie we're going to be talking about which is a movie that i just recently found out about it also kind of reminded me of like a grindhouse film not like as dark and gritty but it it seemed like just the the plot and there was a lot of aspects about it that were similar to a grindhouse movie. So this is another movie that was written and directed by a female, Bria Grant. Uh, she is also Abby, who is the uh, main character's girlfriend in the movie After Midnight, oh. which we are also going to be talking about a little bit later. I think we're talking about that next week. Um, it also stars Angela Bettis. She's in the horror movie May. She's also in Carrie, the 2002 version. And she was in Girl Interrupted. And David Arquette is also in this. Nice. So... Bodies start to pile up at an Arkansas hospital when a drug user nurse and her cousin try to find a replacement kidney for an organ trafficker. A little bit of trivia. Uh, this film stars not one, but two former pro wrestling world champions. There is Mick Foley, a three-time WWF world champion and one-time TNA champion. I have no idea what TNA means at Pro wrestling, that is not my thing at all. Um, but also David Arquette, who is a one-time WCW World Heavyweight Champion. Shut I had the front no idea. Door. Shut the front I know. door. <laughs> no idea that he was ever a wrestler. I know he looks, he's like so scrawny looking in most of the things he's in now, but. I just pulled a Michael Bluth, him? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he was pretty buff back in the day. I don't know. I know, Damn. Dewey? Deputy Dewey? I just the other day for some reason was thinking about how we always laugh about that part in Scream when he the killer calls Sydney at uh, Rose McGowan's character's house and uh, after like he's already hung up and everything's over Dewey comes out with his gun and then picks up the phone and goes hello and the camera like does this <laughs> close up on him and it's hilarious. Wow. And I'm just going with TNA means tits and ass. I have no idea. I, I don't know. Tits and ass champion. One time tits and ass champion. There we go. Well done, David Arquette. Uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so for like a low budget horror movie that I just recently heard about for the first time ever, um, I'm really glad that I decided to watch it because it was a lot of fun. There is some really, it takes place in the 1990s, I should say. Um, so there's some funny references to Candy's shoes, <laughs> Shut and up. also Y2K. Um, and the the Candy's reference made me giggle a lot. Oh my god, that's amazing! I I totally <laughs> want to watch this now. It reminded me. I don't know if you ever watched Nurse Jackie. Yeah. Um, but it reminded me if they made Nurse Jackie into a horror movie. Awesome. Um, okay. Yeah. It was a lot of fun uh, and also funny. Uh, it was very gory and very bloody, which I don't really mind, uh, especially if it's done in like a fun kind of humorous way. Yeah. Um, it also made me never want to go to Arkansas. Sorry, Arkansas. <laughs> That's hilarious. We just lost our one listener from Arkansas. <laughs> I know. Sorry. All respects to Arkansas. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to talk about a movie that we both enjoyed probably too much. And I'm sure a lot of I, have, I just have a feeling that like it's you and me against the world on this one, Sharon, just because. No, my mom actually watched this and she is not uh, she's never seen any of these movies by the next you will star. Say who it is. Yeah. Yeah. The next star. Um, OK, it's Adam Sandler. We're going to talk about who be Halloween. Woo -woo. But yeah, she she told me that she watched it and she's like, I actually thought it was really good. So fuck, you know what? My parents, I told my parents to watch this because they my parents have seen all of his stuff and love it. OK. And I'm like, you will lose your fucking mind. Watch this movie. I'm going to tell them Sharon's mom's better than you guys now. I mean, she is anyways, but no. What? <laughs> OK, who, who? Let's have our parents fight. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Hubie Halloween, which we love, starring, oh my God, everybody, Adam Sandler, Julie Bowen, Ray Liotta, Kevin James, whatever, June Squibb, Steve Buscemi, Tim Meadows, and 
Maya fucking Rudolph. Um, this movie is definitely for the audience of Adam Sandler's from the 90s, I think, but I love it. Uh, the plot is good natured but eccentric. Community volunteer Hubie Dubois finds himself <laughs> at the center of a real murder case on Halloween night. Despite his devotion to his hometown of Salem, Massachusetts, and its le- legendary Halloween tradition, Hubie is a figure of mockery for kids and adults alike. But it's up to Hubie to save Halloween. Um, so a little bit of trivia. If you watch this movie, which you should, pay attention to all of the t-shirts that all the old ladies are wearing because they're amazing. But one of the t-shirts that Hubie's mother wears has Muff's Diving School written on it. (laughs) And apparently there is actually a small coastal town in County Donegal, Ireland. Donegal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I did it right this time. In Ireland. That is called Muff. And there is indeed a diving school there. So that is hilarious. It's kind of like in Colorado, there's a town called Beaver, and there's a liquor store there that sells t-shirts that says Beaver Liquors with a Q. Oh, I want that shirt. Right? My friend Ryan has one, and I'm jealous. Anyway, thoughts on this movie? I geeked out enough over this on Halloween, but this one's, like I said, for old school Sandler's fans. I loved the links to his old characters and films. His Billy Madison-esque character may still be a big kid at heart, but it was such a fun surprise to see he's acquired ninja bully avoidance skills. This one definitely, it has its very specific audience, but as a member of said audience, I enjoyed every fucking minute of this movie, and it felt like an unexpected homecoming, plus O'Doyle rules! Um, Yeah, as... We talked about in a previous episode, we both like this movie way more than we probably should have, but it's just good, stupid fun and totally agreed. If you're an old school Sandler fan, check it out. Um, There is definitely some laugh out loud moments and it just I like how it really captured that whole Halloween vibe in kind of the same way that Hocus Pocus does. Mm -hmm. And it has just a really good, happy it has a happy, feel-good ending, um, but I'm just going to, since we're getting off topic a lot today, <laughs> why not do it again? Um, since you mentioned that Maya Rudolph is in this, I don't know if you watch Big Mouth, but I want to thank Spencer for introducing me to that show. That show is fucking hilarious, and Maya Rudolph plays the female hormone monster, and she is like her material just everything about her character in that show is solid fucking gold and i think she's one of like the funniest women alive a hundred percent agree with you if you're a fan i mean i know you're a big fan of um bojack horseman and this completely different than bojack horseman Uh but the crude humor <laughs> in really? if you appreciate that in uh, Bojack, you'll really appreciate it. It's it's I think it's like ten times worse in Big Mouth. Like Big Mouth is just it's about children going through puberty, and oh. it's done in like the most like crude, crass, funny way, and it's animated. Oh yeah, and yeah. yeah. It, I wish that kids could watch it, but it's uh, yeah. too adult. <laughs> it's way too adult for children to watch, but it would be a very educational. Thing for them to watch um but yeah. okay now i know what you're talking about i couldn't like picture that be- show before or whatever is it a oh, show it's, so it's a show right it's a show and they yeah. just the fourth season just started and spencer and i started watching it the okay. other day and there was a, a one of the characters gets their period for the first oh, time God. And it's the funniest fucking thing ever like oh I appreciate it so much. (laughs) Is it funnier than your mother calling your aunt while you are trying to play Barbies with your friend in the basement singing loudly, this girl is a woman now? Because that's what my experience was like. Well, if you think uh, t- a talking bloody vagina played by Kristen Wiig. Yes. Who talks and spits out blood clots. You really don't have, you can just stop right there. I'm in. That's amazing. <laughs> All right. Speaking of blood clots, our next movie is Blood <laughs> Quantum. <laughs> Nicely done. The working title was Blood Quantum. <laughs> oh, well done, oh, okay. Spencer. What? Very well done, but now I feel horrible because um, this movie deals with a very serious subject. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Well, we're not making fun of the subject matter. We're making fun of ourselves. No, no, no. 
Yes. All right. So this movie stars Michael Gray Eyes from Fear the Walking Dead and also True Detective. Ella Maya Tailfeathers, who is the writer and director of The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open. Mm. And Forrest Goodluck, who is in The Revenant. So this comes from an article written by the Toronto International Film Festival. The term blood quantum refers to a colonial blood measurement system that is used to determine an individual's indigenous status. In simpler terms, blood quantum is the measurement of what percentage Native American blood that you have. The words take on an even more provocative implication is the title of Jeff Barnaby's sophomore feature, which grimly depicts an apocalyptic scenario where an isolated Mi'kmaq community discovers that they are the only humans immune to a zombie plague. As the citizens, who are mainly white people, of the surrounding cities flee to the Mi'kmaq Reserve in search of refuge from the outbreak, the community must reckon with whether to let the outsiders in and thus risk not just the extinction of their tribe, but of humanity, period. Wow, that's um, not heavy at all. No, not at all. Um, <laughs> yeah, the the whole concept behind this movie is just, it's, uh, I mean, extremely relevant and thought-provoking and just extremely clever to compare, uh, you know, the plight of indigenous people mm. to a zombie outbreak and deal with these really heavy, important topics. Uh, it's a great example of a horror movie getting a very important political message across under the guise of something else. As I mentioned, a zombie film. The acting Which, was really good. Oh, sorry. Go really quick. I was just going to say, I feel like zombie films are often like the vehicle for this kind of like political societal discussion. Oh, for sure. I mean, look at the um, original yeah. uh, Night of the Living Dead, which was a uh, political commentary on race relations right, right, uh, right. during that time. Um, yeah, the, the acting in this movie was really good. It starred a mostly indigenous cast, oh, which nice. is, is great. Um, yeah. There's lots of good blood and gore. Uh, it was a little slow moving, but overall, I really liked it. Cool. Okay, well... Um- we, we've been talking about wanting to see more diversity in horror, um, and we're going to now move to Madrid um, for 32 Malasana Street, and I'm not a native Spanish speaker, so apologies in advance. Um, this is directed by Albert Pinto um, and written by Ramon Campos, Gemma Arniera, David Oria, Salvador S. Molina. And it's starring um, Begonia Vargas, uh, Ivan Marcos, and uh, Bea Segura. I don't, I've not seen other things with these folks, but they are fantastic actors, according to this movie. Um, it is in Spanish. I think I watched this one on Shudder. Um, the basic plot, a family moves to a new house to live the dream of the big city. A house where dreams turn into nightmares. And that's oddly, that was an IMDb plot. Which is oddly, yeah, true, but very vague. Um, but essentially, that's what happens. It's a haunted house movie. It is fucking fantastic. For me, I honestly felt like this movie was like the movie High Tension, but as a slow burn. Like from, I'm not kidding, the opening scene until the very end, I was a total wreck. Like I was completely uneasy from the start. The film fucking knows how to build tension over a very long stretch of time which is awesome and maddening in like the best way possible also i am a total sucker for cute kids with accents or speaking other languages and in this case it's spanish and these kids when they are scared or in danger it just like raises the stakes automatically but visually the architecture of this building that the family moves into is just like staggeringly gorgeous old and classic looking again beautiful set design and set dressing beautiful antique old and creepy uh, this is like a definite recommendation and i don't want to say too much about everything that happens but i just yeah i liked this movie a lot but like i was basically sitting in kind of a closed fetal position but upright the entire fucking time on my couch so like all of, every muscle in my body hurt because it was that intense from start to finish it was so good 
Yeah. Wow. Okay. I think this is definitely going to be a movie that I have to watch. Um, it sounds a little bit similar to His House, which we will be talking about next week. Um, but yeah, the plot sounds kind of similar. And the plot's not going to blow you away. I mean, a haunted house movie, like, you know, whatever. But like, and again, it's these kids. Like the opening scene features these two kids and like the one has like the biggest brown eyes and I just like, but they were so good and just pulled me in. And then I was like terrified for the rest of the movie. Yeah. Some some of my favorite movies don't have incredibly complex plots. I mean, if you have uh, great actors and good character development and a good script, like you don't need a huge heavy plot you know you can you can do amazing things with just like a very simple story so and not gonna lie like every haunted house their building was a lovely lovely place and i (laughs) might even put up with the ghosts because that like old antique look to their building oh it was just fucking gorgeous i loved it yeah well done All right, so moving along, our next movie is Run, which stars Sarah Paulson and Kira Allen, who is um, a newcomer. Uh, She's very, very good. It's about a homeschool teenager who begins to suspect that her mother is keeping a dark secret from her. A little bit of trivia. Kira Allen, the actress who plays Chloe, who is Sarah Paulson's daughter in the movie, She uses a wheelchair in the movie, but also in real life. And the filmmakers purposefully wanted to cast a disabled actress, stating that Hollywood rarely cast disabled actors for disabled roles, which is true. And I'm so glad that they did. Agreed. John Krasinski also thought of that for um, Quiet Place. Thank you. But not to say that the idea shouldn't be shared and done more. That's great. That's awesome. So Run, uh, another little bit of trivia, Run references Stephen King novels several times throughout, the most obvious being the pharmacist who is named Kathy Bates, (laughs) who, of course, Kathy Bates plays Annie Wilkes in Stephen King's Misery. Uh, (laughs) Another character is named Annie. Uh, How is she? Yeah. Um, (laughs) Twin Peaks joke. Inside Twin Peaks joke here. Um, (laughs) Give yourself... 100 points if you caught that. All right. Um, and also the fictional town of Derry is mentioned as well. Derry, of course, is referenced in many of King's novels and short stories, including Pet Cemetery, It, and Gerald's Game. Uh, also, the movie theater in Run is called Carrie. Wow. Which, obviously, we all know that that is another Stephen King novel, um, although the uh, theater is not spelled the same, but yeah. still. Okay. Um, so... This movie, it was okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> I, odd. I, I was hoping for it to be better. Um, the best part about it was Sarah Paulson's performance, uh, although her character is a horrible, evil bitch, but Sarah Paulson is amazingly good at playing those types of characters. She very much is, yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, there was definitely a lot of suspense. Uh, the daughter played by Kira Allen. She's extremely talented. I have not seen her in anything else. And I think this may be one of her first films ever. But the movie was basically uh, the act, which we talked about earlier, the um, miniseries about Gypsy Rose and her mother. It was like a combination of that. Also with Misery. It was like those two together, which is kind of funny because there was obviously multiple references to misery in this film and it it was another one of those movies like the lie that just felt more like a lifetime movie and not a movie that would have had an actual theatrical release which it was supposed to have a theatrical release but if you dig lifetime movies like we do (laughs) i recommend it because this would probably be one of the best lifetime movies ever made okay I honestly not to I know we're not supposed to like judge a book by its cover or whatever but I saw this like advertised on Hulu and I was kind of like hard pass because I feel like everything you just described I got from like the description and like the image so but good to know that that's really interesting that they went all in on like the Stephen King references but like didn't up their game that's weird to me but yeah I wouldn't I wouldn't tell people not to watch it um 
I definitely think if you are a person who enjoys Lifetime movies, for sure, check this out. Like it, if you're in that type of a mood where you're like, yeah. I want to watch something, you know, overly dramatic, but like <laughs> completely unrealistic. Um, and you don't want to watch a Lifetime movie? Watch this. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, our next movie, we did talk about already this year as well, but we're going to fucking do it again because it's so good. I loved Host, which was, is a Shutter movie starring Haley Bishop, uh, Gemma Moore, Emma Louise Webb. Uh, is it Redina? Uh, Dren- Drendrova. All apologies if I said that wrong. And Caroline Ward. Um, the basic plot, six friends hire a medium to hold a seance via Zoom during lockdown, a.k.a. the pandemic. But they get far more than they bargain for as things quickly go wrong. Um, so I actually posted this to our Patreon account just for our Patreon subscribers. What, what? But you can find it. Um, director Rob Savage filmed and released a short film of an actual Zoom call where he pranked his friends. It's kind of amazing. He pretended to be attacked by something in his attic. He didn't tell his friends that he was going to do this. So he wanted because he wanted to get their genuine reactions. Sharon, why are you waving at me? That sounds like something I would do. I a hundred percent. You have you watched the whole video? It's also like most of the stars are clearly his friends because like you're watching this video of his prank and you're like, oh my god, that's like half the cast. Yeah, I didn't watch the short film, but I it sounds hilarious and it also sounds like something I would do. And 100%. we're going to be having a bunch of um, Zoom calls with Spencer's family for Christmas over like a three day period because normally we always rent a big house in Wisconsin and get oh, together right. and people from all over the country uh, come in and we have like a three day Christmas thing. Um, but maybe Spencer, we can plan some sort of like mm. uh, a fake ghost attack or something during one of your family Christmas Zoom Oh my calls. God, that's amazing. I want to help. That's a great mm. idea. Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get you involved somehow, many. All right. But like, for, for real though, <laughs> like this video, it, 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 he didn't tell his friends he was going to do it. So it, he wanted to capture their genuine reactions. Well, duh, that's the whole point. And he put it online and it, after it went viral, uh, Rob Savage approached Shudder about making this quote, I'm putting it in air quotes, feature length version because it's a grand total of 57 minutes. But honestly, that's all this movie needs to be. It was filmed entirely using Zoom during the COVID-19 lockdown of 2020, the worst year ever. <laughs> um, I freaking love this movie. It's clever. It's relevant. It's simple. And in my opinion, effective and scary as hell. Plus, who knew Zoom could transfer or act as a conduit for spirits, am I right? Like, the timing of this film's release was beyond perfect. At the height of stay-at-home orders, really, is when I know- found out about it. And it's kind of relentless in how it plays on our fears of those with isolation issues. And lengthwise, like I said, it never overstays its welcome. Very well played. Totally agree. And I don't mind jump scares. I know you're not the biggest fan of them, but... Especially when you create tension in between and don't only rely on jump scares. Uh-huh. Uh, this, no, I agree. The very end scene of this, it I literally fucking jumped. Um, but It's so good. But yeah, it also did a great job of creating that tension in between those jump scares. And it's short and sweet. And I should probably watch it again. But considering the budget and the filming constraints, very right. well done. Yeah. So, and it is a quick watch, so you can easily rewatch it again because it never sure. gets old. It like literally is the perfect length. It's brilliant. All right. So, our final. Speaking of brilliant. Speaking of brilliant. Uh, yes, the final. This is why I saved this movie for last. Uh, the last movie we're going to be talking about this episode is Possessor, which is directed by Brandon Cronenberg, the son of David Cronenberg. Andrea Riseborough, uh, who we mentioned earlier from the Grudge movie, uh, also in Mandy. Christopher Abbott, who is starting to become one of my favorite new actors. Oh my uh, god, he how good is he? Is in Girls. Uh, he's in The Sinner season one, and yeah, he really, really shows his range in this movie. Yeah, really good. Uh, 
Jennifer Jason Lee is also in this. Uh, Sean Bean, uh, who everyone probably knows as either <laughs> Ned Stark from Game of Thrones or from uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy as <laughs> Boromir, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and I, I love the fact that his name, his first and last names are spelled basically identical, yep. but they have completely different pronunciations. Yeah. Um, good observations, Spencer. <laughs> Moving on. Moving on. So... Possessor follows an agent who works for a secretive organization that uses brain implant technology to inhabit other people's bodies, ultimately driving them to commit assassinations for high paying clients. And that's putting it simply like I kind of even feel like we shouldn't even say anything because I went into this completely cold and literally just saw it show up in like my recommended list and texted Sharon and was like, holy shit, did you know that David Cronenberg-san made a movie? And she was like, yes, asshole. So <laughs> I think you guys watched this before me, but I like just watched this this week. I actually ended up buying this because it was only three bucks more to buy it than it was to rent like digitally. And I'm really glad I did. I just don't know when I'm going to watch it again because <laughs> I need time. But sorry, keep going. Clearly, I think you know how I feel about this already. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, So a little bit of trivia here. While developing the movie in pre-production, Brandon Cronenberg found himself gathering inspiration from the films of Dario Argento, particularly opera. Uh, I think that's very noticeable in this movie. Um, There's also two versions of the script. Brandon Cronenberg has said that there is a possibility of a second movie down the line, one that would encompass the material that did not make it into this film. And also, we mentioned this earlier with... What movie? <laughs> the Invisible Man? Yes. Thank, thank you. you. We talked about so many movies. I couldn't, you know. I blanked I like, completely. Yeah. Exactly. But most of the special effects in Possessor were done practically with an effort to use as little VFX work as possible. What is VFX? As a visual effects. CGI visual would effects. be better okay. there. Yeah. You, yeah. Usually I um, it's called something else. I don't think I've ever heard VFX. Just say special effects. Special effects. We all know what you mean. Uh, <laughs> Hocus Pocus. Movie magic. Um, there you go. Although I would actually, practical effects would probably be yeah. characterized as movie magic because that's what they were. There was before not a lot computers. of digital enhance- enhancement in terms of any of the gore or killings or not killings or horror. Let's put it that way. Agreed. Trying to be non-spoilery. So the hallucination scenes in this movie in particular were done in camera and Cronenberg credits his effects specialist Dan Martin and Derek Liscombe. Uh, apologies if I mispronounce that. Um, and his longtime cinematographer Kareem Hussein for being able to pull off convincing visuals with a minimal use of CGI. Um, yeah. Well done, uh, everybody. Very, very well done. Um, I really liked this Dude. movie. And this is one of those movies that lives up to the hype. Brandon Cronenberg definitely has his dad's talent. And they <laughs> also share kind of a similar style. Yeah. Um, the cast is great. As I said, Christopher Abbott, like, bam. Like, he just jumped up like 20 notches did not see that shit coming did not see that coming at all he was amazing and, yeah agreed. and just the whole concept of this movie is fascinating i actually did read the plot before i went into it um because i just didn't know if this would be too heavy for me um i you know there's a time and a place for watching um how do i want to say this for just watching something that is not only like a psychological horror, but also in that whole sci-fi world that sometimes just gets like way too heady for a me. A really good mind fuck about reality. Yeah. Like it's kind of yeah. like the, the it's similar to the Matrix in many ways. And I was just like, man, can my brain handle this right now? Because <laughs> like I worked all day and I was kind of tired. Um, but this is like my favorite kind of horror because it's the scariest of all questioning your own reality but with that being said i didn't think the movie was as confusing as i thought it would be like it made a lot of sense to me um so don't be turned off by that if you're like oh can i handle a movie like this right now um it's just 
the whole concept of the movie is so fascinating. Mm -hmm. Like how weird it must be to live in other people's bodies and to like do that for a living. And there was like so many little details that were written into the film dealing with the logistics behind inhabiting another person's body that were just really well thought out and also made the whole futuristic scenario and concept of the movie a lot more believable. Uh, tons of beautiful and disturbing imagery. I mean, like the gore in this movie was just like extremely visceral because not only was it what you were seeing, but there was a great, um, there was great use of audio that accompanied the gory scenes that just made it even more intense. Um, He used a lot of disorienting visual shots, lots of like handheld shots, asymmetric framing, spinning shots, upside down shots that just like helped you get into the heads of the characters as they were both kind of like losing their minds a little bit. Um, And the special effects, a lot of unique stuff that I had not seen before, including one scene that I'm just going to say or describe it as a uh, quote body pouring scene um, and pouring as like pouring water or something. Um, But I've not seen anything like that done before. And yeah, the fact that most of these effects were practical effects just made it even better. So, uh, yeah. Obviously, I liked the film a lot. I mean, holy fuck shit balls. This was one of the most intense movies I've seen in a long time. But, like, I literally, from, like, the start of the movie, I was, again, almost sitting in that, like, upright fetal position on your couch. Um, I should also mention that, like, a random On my couch. (laughs) What? You said on your couch. Oh, did I? Oh. Yeah. I'm like, you weren't on my couch, were you? Uh, From almost the beginning, I was tense and sitting in like an upright field position on my couch. Um, I should also mention that like a random fear of mine is being unsure of your own reality. I don't mind like hallucinating or seeing ghosts or whatnot. Like more like what happens in Oculus or uh, really quick spoiler at the very end of this film. Um, there's a speech that I wrote the quote, I wrote it down. I'm not going to say it because it's a spoiler, but basically talks about where do ideas come from and are they yours? What if they're not yours? And how do you deal with that? This movie fucked with me. I'm still processing it, but I can say without a doubt, this movie was fantastic and I'll be pondering its themes for a long, long time to come. Um, it'll probably be, what's that? I said, good thing you bought it. To- oh my again. god i don't know when i'm gonna watch this again but like that's a compliment i think to the film so yeah this was fucking good thank you all for listening to us as always you can write to us at horse talk horror at gmail.com let us know what your favorite and least favorite horror movies of 2020 are, especially the least favorite ones. Those are so funny. Um, you can always send us any ghost stories, true crime stories, cult stories, the time you stayed at an Airbnb and it turned into a nightmare stories, or the time you were on a Zoom call with your friends and some spirits started attacking you, or whatever you want to share that we can read on our show. We would love it. Please subscribe to us and rate and review us. It helps us get more exposure. And if you are able to, you can join our Patreon if you want to get early access to episodes, hear and see exclusive content, and maybe get some cool shit. Maybe. Just maybe. Speaking of cool shit, we want to give a shout out to our newest patron, Thank you so much, Janine Fitzgerald. Uh, We really, really appreciate it. And we sent you something. Hopefully you received it in the mail. Um, I know it's been crazy with uh, delays in in the postal service right now. I mean, they're so overwhelmed as it is on top of like Christmas season. So um, if you haven't gotten anything in the mail, you will get something soon. Um, But just thank you again. And also with the tier that you signed up for, you also get an on air birthday shout out. You have a birthday coming up on 1226. So we just wanted to say happy birthday. And we have a little birthday song for you. Yeah, we do. All right. Ready? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. It's your birthday. Your birthday. Hop, Hop around, skip around, around jump around the table, table. fingers in the frosting, blow out the candles. Happy birthday. <laughs> they, you guys lost me after the first uh, verse, but happy birthday, Janine. <laughs> 
A for effort for trying to do that, Minnie. <laughs> well, for the for the first time and also over Zoom where there's a delay. So that, we did not think that one through. Whatever. Happy birthday. Yay. <laughs> Happy birthday. And thank you for supporting us. We really appreciate it. We do. Uh, don't forget to listen next week to hear the rest of our 2020 horror movie discussion. We will also be sharing our top and bottom <laughs> horror movie picks of the year. Please be kind to each other out there. Be safe. And as always, thanks for getting creepy with us. Sharon, you want a beer? Uh, oh my God.